Welcome to the first session of the seminar, A Paradigm Shift, Curating and Exhibition Making in the Age of Continuous Mediation. Um, the main drivers and description for the seminar are, is it possible to define curatorial practice today without extending its horizons to rethinking the educational, institutional, and also the paracuratorial? How will the brief history of curating evolve into the future? Do current forms of mediation and negotiation in the art world really function for diverse audiences? Bringing the recent roles attributed to the curator, such as an activist, comrade, or educator, this service seminar engages critical methodologies from leading curatorial research and practices. Firstly, as a mental space for thinking through and together with artistic practices, curating is not only a dramaturgical setting in the sense of a spatial and conceptual staging of artworks and their interconnectedness, but also a series of audience-engaged discursive processes aimed to connect to the larger real of the social. As a series of conversations, this seminar will focus on the questions of creating and exhibition making as an extended field for new publics. Moderated by Ms. Saladnan, Ildis, it will connect significant collaborations, networks, and projects with shared commonalities of ethics, community, collectivity, and political agenda in the field. So that's it. Misal, take it away. Welcome to the first session. As you can imagine, I'm very excited, but at the same time, I would like to take this opportunity to remember all the practitioners, practitioners of the contemporary art field, maybe uh, architecture and relevant uh, fields, to uh, understand what has happened in the last couple of months, especially because of the COVID-19. We have lost so many people, so many important people who uh, didn't have enough time to develop an intergenerational relevance for uh, creating some more converse conversations. What I would like to uh, say is, I mean, there's a quote from Caroline Christophe Bacarguet. She says, a whole generation might be wiped out, but all so artists, writers, philosophers, architects, and filmmakers, it can be traumatic for a culture and a civilization. So we strongly believe that the elderly should be taken care of. I was more interested in bringing a kind of blessing in the beginning of our session, because uh, I mean, there's another quote from Maya uh, Angelo that I would like to read now. I think of that and of late the idea has come with alarming frequency. I seem at peace with the idea that a day will dawn when I will no longer be among those living in this valley of strange humans. I can accept the idea of my own demise, but I'm unable to accept the death of anyone else. I find it impossible to let a friend or a relative go into that country of no return. This belief becomes my close companion and anger follows in its wake. I answer the heroic question, dead, where is the sting with it's here in my heart and mind and memories? Maya wrote this in her book, Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now, which is dated 1993. I mean, among many others, we lost David. And David Grishel was an amazing uh, art historian, artist, educator, and also uh, a big contributor for the current position of African-American art. And especially one of his groundbreaking exhibitions, Two Centuries of Black American has been an important reference. So I would like to rem remember some of those names and just respect and acknowledge their presence. So it's for me very important as an Anatolian queer person, I would like to connect with our ancestors, connect with the old spirits, but also connect with our genealogy. And it's very relevant how I define myself because I think as a curator today, uh, in order to take a position, define your position or frame your practice, it's also important how you relate this practice to yourself. Manuel Ferguerez, Rafael Leonardo Black, Abraham Platnik, Motoko Fujishiro Putwaite, Roger Whiteside, Germano Gelant, David Leveret. Hello, McDaniels, David Torren, John Fall, William Gertz, Anne Sullivan, Norman Gulamarian, 
Nick 707 Jillian Wise John Driscoll Rifat Shadirji Tom Blackwell Helen Icon Charlotte Charlotte on Wing Juan Jimenez Ricardo de Libert Richard de Liberto David Driscoll Javiera Rodriguez Patrick Devetian Michael McKinnon, Michael Sortin, Paul Karslake, Morris Berger, Ronald Lewis, Victoria Gregotti, Liu Shua. Of course, among all of them, we I, I had a uh, more close relationship with uh, Michael Sortin because of my PhD. And all architecture is political, is a quote from him. And on the other hand, uh, let's remember Vittoria Gregotti saying, the task of the architectural project is to reveal through the transformation of the form, the essence of surrounding context. Uh, I'm going to close the door very quickly. It's very warm here, but at the same time, we need to compromise if it is the sound or the quality of sound or the heat. I am very welcome to suffer for you. So let's start with this uh, sculpture. No, it is an important element for defining my practice. So some of you who have been in the recent Sky Screen Seminar, this might be a repetition, but it will be very, very short. I would like to relate this with the rest of the seminar. So for me, framing yourself, your position, your history, your relationship with your practice is so important in order to define any curatorial position. So this sculpture is in my hometown in the middle of Anatolia in Karama. And on my way to the school, every day I pass by this. Uh, this was originally an old bronze bus, but later replaced by a fiberglass plastic version. And it represents Mehmet Bey, Karamanol Mehmet Bey, who was the second ruler of this uh, province. And <coughs> under the uh, bust, it writes, we can go to the next actually, uh, Raphael, if you, if you would help me with the image. Yeah, let's also see the text below. From this day henceforth in the Dervish convent, the council, the palace, the parliament, and all the public places, no language other than Turkish shall be permitted. I mean, since this text is written only in Turkish, I was always wondering who didn't speak the language, questioning the logic behind this text, because if you didn't speak language, if you didn't speak Turkish, and if you are not permitted to speak any other language in that location, how would you understand the proclamation? Like, given that information is only communicated in Turkish, it's a very oxymoron situation. It's only written in Turkish, and it says no other language than Turkish is not permitted. So there's a kind of really vicious circle. And, and don't forget, when you are five, six years old, when you just can recognize the letters, when you just can connect them in a word, in a sentence, in a paragraph, and through the years, you understand the context behind it. And now I'm thinking, maybe I might have become a curator just to understand that statue and the park and the bust as an object and the statue as a form of materiality and the park as an example of public space and language as a mental space that reflects politics. Of course, uh, how would they punish people who wouldn't speak uh, tur Turkish? I mean, also my cousins who live in Germany were coming and visiting and when they have difficulty with language, they were immediately switching into German. And my father used to run a, a workshop. A lot of Kurdish workers were there. And when my grandfather leaves for the mosque, they would immediately increase the volume of the radio to hear the Kurdish radio. So I, I grew up with this tension around the language. And uh, in 1928, as a, on a very personal initiative, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who is the founder of the Republic, established a 29 letter Latin alphabet for Turkish. And he took maybe the biggest risk of uh, 
public education and overnight the number of literate people in the country radically dropped. And within five years, the mobilization of the alphabet we established the Turkish language, especially reading and writing increased. I grew up with a grandmother who didn't write and read the Latin alphabet as fluent, while much later I confronted the fact that I myself couldn't continue doing more research in the Ottoman archives. So mine was not the only case. Moving from this, I decided to come along with this. Uh, Rafael, can we go to the Fulusa? Yes, exactly. And maybe the top drawing can be a little bit zoomed in because I find the relationship with home, the promise of home, and also orientation and disorientation, which is going to be a major subject at the last lecture of the seminar series is very relevant to think today. This very pixelated drawing is from Fluster, William Fluster archive. So it's hard to find a good resolution, but, but in order to understand my voice, my position, my frame, maybe it is good to go through this uh, drawing. Fluster did it. Native, immigrant, traveler, and exile. And they are circulated around the migrants. So there is an aesthetic problem. There is a political problem, but there is a creativity problem. But all corresponds to a level of writing. Can we go to the other one, Rafael? Author and environment. So let's look at the author and environment like more close. And then you see how modernity and antiquity is uh, differentiated. So let me keep up rolling the ball with two more quotes from Flusser, and then we will understand why uh, where we are talking about it. Thus, the man who analyzes himself recognizes the degree to which his secret rootedness in home has obscured his clear view of the scene. He recognizes not only that every home blinds those involved on its own way, but also that in this sense, all homes are equal. Most of all, non-coercive judgments, decisions, and actions become possibly only after overcoming this involvement in home. And then in another one, he says, I mean, both are quoted from a text written originally in German, Wohnung Bezien in the Heimatlose Kite. It was my birth that threw me into my first homeland without anyone asking me if this was something I wanted. The chains that bound me here to my neighbors were, for the most part, placed on me. In my own hard-won freedom, it is I who ties the bins that connect me to my neighbors in cooperation with them. Unlike the one who is left behind and who remains mysteriously chained to his neighbors, I'm instead bound to them by my own free will. These ties are not less emotionally and sentimentally charged than his chains, but rather just as strong and more independent. This, I believe, demonstrates what freedom means. So there is a relationship between <laughs> winning or gaining your freedom, but also attaching and deattaching your home. Uh, I was referring to a film and I provided the link with English subtitles. Is there anyone who watched it actually? Uh, Tulin, what do you think? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I watched it last night at the last minute. Um, Good. We were late with providing it. We yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's int like, I'm curious to actually ask, like, why you chose this film and why, are, why you asked for us to watch it in the context of this seminar. And, and there are so many things, like, it's from 1975, right? Like, it's impossible not to, like, read the film also from this moment and think about, like, how um immigrants were viewed uh in northern europe at the time and think of how the situation is now and particularly i guess for turkish immigrants yeah it was intense i mean yeah it's i have, a lot, to say. I have a lot to say depending on the context but it was extremely intense there is a scene when they are all lost in the uh, metro and it becomes very carnivalesque when they watch Swedish people in the restaurant, when they get in the restaurant, it completely becomes a kind of black comedy. Like, even there is no 
uh, conversation anymore. It's just like uh, a pandemic, you know, you, they manage to tell everything. I mean, don't forget Flusser with the idea of seeing the immigrant as he, from the traveler perspective, from the exile perspective, from the self-made intellectual perspective. I insist, I mean, I, I, I think I'm going to make a statement to uh, bring this discussion to a focus because uh, I have to admit that still curating is a space for thinking for me. So when I define this practice, I look for intellectual foundations of this political, social, cultural, and psychological climate. So in this sense, uh, the personal references, how they become public, is very important. Specifically this film, of course, it has been censored. It has been uh, difficult to show this film in Turkey, especially during the military coup d'etat. And there are many other stories that involves with this film, but what I did with Constal Se in 2007, in 2010 and 11, in collaboration with Kim Einarsson, was a statement. We invited Tun Chokan, the director, 30 years later, back in this public space, Sergej Stork, which is this amazing geometric uh, public sphere, the modernist public sphere of Stockholm, where the bus originally stopped in the field. And we screened the film there. We did a great workshop. But like all these left-wing radical people from 70s, 80s, now he's in Nice and he became a neoliberal dentist. And he, it was a bit annoying to revisit this conversation with him. But one thing that we asked to him and we worked with him was very important for me. This film is made by an actor. Like uh, Tunch was an actor. So... They read a news with Tunjel Curtis, the other uh, amazing actor, and they developed the script through that news, which was more happening in Germany. Like literally, there was a guy who was cheated by their friend. They were left in the middle of somewhere, paid passports and money was taken. So this sort of alienation, we effect this sort of Beckett, this sort of Brechtian, this sort of waiting for Goda kind of situation seriously happened and they were insp inspired by the uh, story and then they decided to make it and rather than Germany, Sweden, the mu film museum in Sweden responded so with a Swedish producer they literally produced it but what interests me was the open script writing and how they use the city as a space, as a studio, as a set and actually before knowing the end of film they already started shooting. So all the workshop in 2010 and 11 with Tun Chokan, with Constance, focused on how we use the city, how we use the reality, how we use the current situation, the current climate, political climate, as I said, as a space, as a studio. And this way of working, rather than a director, an actor directing this film, uh, is an important reference because I'm going to make a statement. Last time when I was teaching, Mohammed Salami really quoted this several times. I think this is the point where I would like to start discussing curating. Personally speaking, I learned curating from artists. This is why an actor with an open script writing technique, directing a film is an important example for me. Like, not something like artists are curating or artists as curators, but literally, if we are going to define a history for curating, if we are going to discuss curating, there is no space, there is no other space than the artistic research and practice to connect this. This is why the last session of this curatorial seminar is going to also bring a lot of artists together as a kind of round conversation with you. And if you want to become a curator, if you want to learn this practice, if you want to extend your knowledge in this practice. The only uh, tip that I could, the only suggestion, the only recommendation I would, I would bring here is just be curious about art and be curious about talking with the artists, going into the studio, asking them questions. Of course, the institutional, the organizational, the financial aspects of this practice will be in the game. They will develop different uh, 
directions, destinations, and routes for you, but curating without art and artist means nothing. Who else has seen the film? I mean, I, I just want to say that I really enjoyed how they put the bus in the middle of a place, in the middle of the park. I found, I found it very, I mean, striking because you're putting the, I, I, you put it a question in the middle of the public space, and it it's it seems that everybody's kind of getting uh, why this buzz is here. So this uh, this feeling the of insider and outsider, the gaze. Yeah, the exactly. Do you remember they waited so long in the bus because they exactly. a fellow, and they think yeah. that he's gonna come with the passport. But ironically, it's so smart. It's such an artistic mm -hmm. idea that. He leaves them in the middle of the public space, like in the middle of a reality. Yeah, it's amazing because it's a sort of rupture. People are not expecting to find a buzz in the middle of the way. And they're like, why it's here? And what's happening? So I like it very much. And I guess this has to do with curating, how to make the space uh, uncomfortable to, to the ones who are seen. I don't know. Uh... What do you think about the acting and performing? Can we relate this sort of acting with performing? Because in this lecture, I also want to discuss with you a lot about curating performance. If we need to select a kind of parallel line, Julia uh, Erdemci, Augustin Perez Ribio, Maria Lind, Mohamed Salami, Bina Choi, Charla Eich, they're all coming from different directions and they are going to contribute to this program from different aspects but we are very lucky in our guests we have a dramaturg and dramaturgy is a very interesting uh, uh, practice i mean especially i don't know because of uh, maybe me too we can be a bit silent when we are pronouncing his name jens hoffman and uh, Joanna Varsava or Andrea uh, Phillips, like there are a lot of people coming from stage performance and dramaturgy background, theater background, and they are really redefining this practice. And uh, in one of the weeks, Kasra, can you tell me when was Chao last time? Is it 6th of September? Do I misremember? Just a second. Is Adnan, so I can make sure when it's exactly. September, yes. Okay. Chala Ilk, she comes from a dramaturgy background. And specifically in that session, I really, really would like to talk a lot with you about what curating performance could mean for us today and during this transition. What could, uh, what, what does it mean to understand performance now? And I think when you consider all the last couple of months dealing with different aspects of confrontation with the dead, rise of the rage, transformation of the public space, lack of medical attention, social inequality, digital capitalism, like boo, I think among all of them, I'm completely in love with following the transformation of performance. I think if you ask me personally, performance survived. This is why even we talk about the film, the example that I bring here is very relevant because uh, Mariana, you have seen it and you, you can tell easily like there's a difference between acting and performing in this film, right? Yes, and but to me it was more about performance because I really enjoyed how how people, how the actor actually appear. For instance, they don't talk very much. Most of the time they're in silent. And to me, this was so powerful. Do you remember when they are going through the metro stairs? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And to me, this was just striking because I, was, I wasn't impressed by their acting. I was impressed about how they were appearing in the city and how they were walking around this place they don't know. So, and especially the bus, to me it was, I mean, it was such a revelation of so, my, so many controversies. 
about, I mean, everything. So the bus is actually a kind of protagonist. Yeah, to me it was. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protagonist. I mean, uh, let's now go back uh, to the beginning of the seminar once again. And let's imagine that I'm restarting it because with the bus, with the example from Flusser, all these quotations about home, talking about the statue in my hometown, starting with blessings that people we have lost during COVID-19. When we go back to the beginning of the session, I should have told you like, well, there is like in the last hour, we are going to spend the uh, half an hour on connecting through how we develop a glossary together. And the last half an hour, more talking about who are our guests and why they are here and how we are going to deal with the calendar. And actually my intention was like after the blessings and the short introduction about myself to think of uh, theoretical tools that we could use during the session. Now, uh, I, I feel a bit like uh, I'm super excited about also the diversity of the class. Like when I was checking who is taking the course and now especially uh, technology allows me to see all of you in a kind of uh, form, like a, like a, a, let's say, picture of plurality. Uh, now actually I want to have a little uh, short break. I would like that, now I told you my protagonist is this statue from my hometown and my protagonist is this bus where migrants are left in the middle of Stockholm. If we are gonna develop a seminar program together. I would like to also offer you a kind of parallel process that maybe we could develop exhibition proposals together. I would like that from this process, each of you would think of an exhibition they would like to produce. And are you curious about how you make exhibitions? Definitely, then you took this course. Are you curious about how an exhibition is formed or how an exhibition idea come to you? Or how do you work on an idea of an exhibition? So if you don't mind, I would like that each of us tell us their names and tell us where do they come from? And if they need to, but you have to really trust me in this, you have to just tell the first thing that comes to your mind and believe the physicality, the spontaneity, the simultaneity of coll co collectivity. So for instance, we can start saying your name, where you come from, but either a bus or this br uh, bronze statue, what would be your protagonist that you would think of as a relationship between you and the image? Because both this statue and this film have a foundational aspect and impact on the understanding of image for myself. In your context, it could be a song, it could be an architectural reference, it could be anything. Shall we just go one round because we are not doing so bad with time because I also want to know you a little bit and Tulin, we start with you because you are uh, like me very social. Why? Why with me? No, of course, I'll start. So um, my name is Tulin. I am from Jordan, from Amman, but I live in Toronto now. So I'm talking to you from Toronto. Amman is such a beautiful country, no? Yeah. I miss it. I'm stuck now. Cannot go anywhere. Um, but I guess like a lot of people. So I've been here for four years and I've been working with um, a small artist run center called Savak. It's an artist run center that works with artists of color in Toronto. Um, and before that in Amman, I was working for like 10 years as a kind of independent curator and writer and researcher. And my La latest project was Spring Sessions, which was an artist, um, like a residency program and a learning program that happened every spring. Um, and yeah, the first thing that comes to, I mean, I'm like thinking a lot about both the monument that you presented and the bus, the monument, because actually one of the first curatorial writing projects I did was about a monument in Amman that was erected in a public space um, after the Arab Spring and all the protests that took took place in that public space. Then they fenced it off and built a, a very weird monument that, you know, nobody really understands why it's there. 
So I'm thinking of these kind of like imposed monuments and obviously mm -hmm. it's also very relevant to what's happening mm -hmm. around the world now with, with monuments being taken down. Later, promise me to send the image of this. I would love to see will. the image of Yeah, yeah, I will, I will. Um, and yeah, I mean, the bus and the film, for me, it was also interesting or to think about, like to, re to relate it to what I'm thinking about now is this, is this question of time, I guess, and this question of waiting and, and like how to use time as a strategy. Um, I found that like, comp or that, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about like time as an artistic strategy. Um, so I kind of like connected with it on, on that level. Although there's also like a lot of issues I find with the film. Um, totally, totally, yeah. totally. But, but what uh, was interesting, like just to go back to this thing about the no dialogue um, that Mariana was saying, like not much dialogue. I found that super interesting also because it was very much about like the city and the setup but also about like, like really basic kind of facial and bodily expressions by the actors. Um, so it was very much just kind of like, I felt like bodily kind of understanding or reading of the, of the film or spatial, let's say, yeah. Spatial, I would say spatial. Um, yeah, so these are the things that are coming Thank to Thank you so much. Right Elaine, is it right pronunciation? Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's completely right. Um, hi everyone, my, my name is Elaine. Uh, I, I'm speaking to you from London, uh, where, where I live and work. Um, I'm, a, I'm an art worker and a writer and sometimes curator. Uh, and I recently graduated from a course called Contemporary Art Theory at Goldsmiths University. Um, I guess if I were to spontaneously think of Think of something. I, I suppose it would be this kind of, you know, uh, intergenerational haunt. My my grandmother's from Hong Kong, and she worked as a seamstress. And uh, and for me, I think a lot about, you know, the social fabric or exhibition making and curation as, you could say, uh, a binding agent uh, of many different things, of histories, of peoples, um, of different kinds of forces collaborative thinking, essentially. Um, but also a seamstress, as she, as she worked anyway, uh, had a lot to do with tailoring. So a lot of one, one to one personal work to adjust things and make things and make things right and fit well. Um, so there was this kind of corporeal understanding and something very intimate that was happening there as well. Um, Thank you for bringing this out because a paradigm shift might be understood as the frame of this seminar, but actually when it becomes a publication, we are considering continuous mediation as mm -hmm. the title. And like you, uh, my grandmother, Anatolian grandmother, gave me such an insight about thinking on this term, continuous mediation. And it's so important because you are so right. It's so much building, con like curating today how we define it in an institutional or not institutional context, doesn't matter, you're, you're right. Actually, it's so much about building relationships, mm -hmm. connecting with the community and sustaining these relationships and conversations at a level of uh, understanding your own position through politics. It is very relevant. So, so your grandmother is the protagonist. Yes, <laughs> I, th I think so. Um, if Very I were nice. to reach for something, yes. Thank you. Kasra? Okay, hi. So, I'm Kasra, and maybe some of you know me. I work at the News Center, and my interest in art began around more than half a decade ago that I started working in some galleries in Tehran. And then I moved to Europe and now I am working with Mohamed Salemi. I'm his assistant for his curatorial projects that he is doing right now. And my interest in exhibition making goes back to my interest in video games actually, which is like something that maybe could be unrelatable, but I'm really interested in making exhibitions and curating shows that they are interactive with the audience, that the audience are not just observers, but 
they become like a part of the work itself and how they could also be a piece of art, not just as some outsider who comes and rather they understand it or not. But you were working in a gallery in Tehran as far yes, as- Yes, I did. So did the video games or the Tehran gallery yes. start before? Yes. Oh, the video game idea is like my imaginations actually. But in Tehran, I had the idea because the gallery that I was working with, they were working with the Iranian diaspora that they haven't been showed in Iran, maybe never. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to bring back these artists to the country. And they were like really important people like in elder generation that they were like essential artists in Iran. And they were, they work were almost, how can I say conservative and traditional. Mm -hmm. So for them, that concept wasn't really significant at that point. And now because of the political issues that is happening in the country, they decided to close down the gallery and because of the sanctions. So people couldn't afford actually buying the works. And it was really problematic for them to work. And yeah, that's, I'm like, I don't have any academic studies in arts. Well, I'm about to begin. And yeah, everything so far has been experimental. And oh, sorry, I didn't have time to watch the film. And I told you in person, actually. But like, now everybody's gonna watch yeah, it because yeah, thanks sure. to Tulil, uh, and Mariana, they made a great uh, intro for it. And Bert Bertrand. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me, everyone? Very good. Yes. Perfect. So my name is Bertrand. I'm living in Portugal at the moment, um, but I'm back in France now. Actually, I'm next to Toulouse in the south of France, um, and I uh, work with. Um, I work in the library. I mean, until recently, I worked in the library. I worked at various places, organizing parties. So mostly like the live part of um, the exhibition. And, uh, you know, I, I would say if I had to choose one object, I kind of tried to chase it from my mind. But it would be like a trampoline park where you can just uh, kind of rekindle ideas and thoughts and knowing that uh, an exhibition space is often closed. So there's nice. the, the part that you have to get in, you know, but once you get in, you can just uh, change a lot of things, you know. I don't know if that's very relevant, but you mentioned- It also. is relevant because I think the exhibitions are not forms of one entry and one uh, uh, like exit. Mm -hmm. We can revisit the exhibitions from different exit and entry levels and mm -hmm. their narratives. And politics can be uh, completely interacting with different levels of the society because imagine you make an exhibition. It would be ideal if your elementary school teacher, your mother, your art professor, your colleague would get different things from this content development at different levels. Because I think it's important to make things public at a level of uh criticality i mean if you don't if you allow me i would like to uh I, I would like to clarify about it like because i mean i studied psychology also and uh, curating came into my uh, focus much later mm -hmm. and recently i was writing for uh, a periodical in istanbul and they were asking what is like Orhan Pamuk, our Nobel winner writer, wrote a book called Black Book. And then he starts new life story, Yeni Hayat. He starts this novel saying, one day I read a book and my life has changed. So this uh, curator friend of us, Didem Yazıcı, from Karlsruhe actually, she's investigating and asking several professionals from Istanbul and Istanbul context, what is the exhibition that changed your life? I think I answered this question by saying, Yuko Hasegawa's seventh Istanbul Biennial, which was Ego Fugai. And I still remember this exhibition so clearly. And the reason that I remember that exhibition so clearly was my position as an audience was so amazing. So if there is any position I enjoy the most in this context, it is the position of the audience. Mm -hmm. So if you want to curate, 
if you want to practice art, if you want to contribute in this field, another tip would be to try to enjoy the position of the audience as much as you can, because if you don't surprise yourself, you don't surprise your audience. Mm -hmm. right. And mostly I define my practice saying in my, in fact, my professional identity arises from recognizing that all of the activity occurs as an audience to an audience. It is self-reflexive. This shift between state of reception and production or more the ability to consciously make this shift is what characterizes me as an agent a term used in the sense carried by Hannah Arendt, and she uses it as more like human as an agent of their existence, as one who simultaneously has the ability to impose those choices onto the world. The potential for agency doesn't belong to me. It's my belief that any audience can receive and produce. Given the proper conditions for awareness within this belief, I approach my role as a curator, as a director, as an organizer, or as an exhibition maker. This is more or less the theoretical vision. I mean, Hannah Arendt is a god, goddess to me, but like uh, specifically taking this term, agent and action, curator and exhibition, just crush them into each other. So you see, I love those frogs. Did you kiss them? Mm -hmm. Any prints are coming out from them. So I, hello, I mean, hello. see, yeah, I like, um, I like frog and toads. Um, Lovely. So I am in Beijing right now and I'm Chinese. And for the last um, six years, I live in um, the US and I'm a PhD student in art history and archeology. span um, Me too, um, I'm also a PhD student. A real, a really cool. Hello. Is it, yeah. Is it gonna finish? <laughs> but, when is it gonna finish? No, I just started, and actually, ah. in I'm in a program in the states, so it's a master and PhD combined. So it's gonna take a while. Um, but because of COVID, um, I'm return home indefinitely. Um, and then yes, yeah, so I'm interested for my research. I'm interested in like I. I for archaeology, I study actually the Mediterranean, especially Greece archaeology, but I'm especially interested in an intersection between contemporary art practice and archaeological sites. Um, and so that's why you know I, I'm so amazed by the classical form of theatrical stage, like yeah. audience and the spectator, like this different levels of hierarchies defining mythology and the whole identity of Greek democracy and republic. It's a good source. You're on the right Yeah, me page. too. Yeah, I think there's a lot of to get out there's of There's a lot. There's um, a lot, actually. Especially right now with the democracy. Um, and then, um, um, yeah, so that's why um, I'm Who interested in contemporary art and if curator. You, if you need to um, develop an exhibition proposal, what is your inspiration? What's your muse? What's your protagonist? Uh, my bedroom. Oh, Tracy, I mean. <laughs> or, or my home, really, because I like to party. Actually, I used to host parties, but then now I can't. So, um, and I'm nice. stuck in my home. So I would, um, I think that's my new protagonist. Amazing. And then, yes, and I also watched a film, and then I um, would like to say that I think there's two parts I really like, which is the disjunction between. Um, like languages in space because there, there's some point of talking German and then also I think Swedish and then um, there's no English but then there's I think Turkish where I feel like the changing languages makes me feel like oh I don't know where I am anymore so that's I think that's something that caught my attention and then the other thing is that when I think the first death of the guy uh, who was on the bridge and then he fell onto the water and then a passenger said a piece of shit but then nobody would really hear and the person who died couldn't even understand the language so that I think also is also interesting. You see I am sure you know my favorite Rihanna song. We found love in that hopeless space. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so I see a very beautiful smile and it's written Kelly Maksud. Oh, Hi, um, I'm, I'm Kelly. I am currently based in New York. I am. How is the situation there? Are you guys, are you doing fine? I, yeah, I'm okay. I mean, like, I think it's definitely gotten a lot better than what it was a few months ago. It's other places in America that we're more scared of than New York at this point. Um, I, I'm going into my second year of an MFA program at Columbia. So I'm sort of coming from this uh, as an artist. Um, I am interested in, I'm really interested in sound and I'm exploring a lot of sound and um, specifically national anthems right now. And um, I'm sort of trying to think about strategies around anthems resist sort of like fixity of place and sort of expand beyond borders and thinking specifically like I work on the position of Africa because that's where I was raised. Um, where were you yeah. raised? Where were you raised? So I'm I was born in Kenya and raised in Kenya but my family is Tanzanian and my father was Muslim, so I grew up Muslim, but my mother was Christian, so I also had to go to church on Sundays. So I think that just having that sort of expansive. We need country. to talk about my Big Dash origins. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I just wonder like how things can like be recentered all the time and sort of shifting a center and not having one fixed place. Jada, I have one question you don't have to answer, but. What is the most characteristic sound that you remember from your memory, like earlier memory? Sound of something, someone, a place, like? Uh, it's probably laughter. <laughs> like, Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, my um, mom's side of the family is very loud. And I think <laughs> in contrast, like they contrast with my dad's side of the family who are extremely quiet. So I just always remember like laughter, feeling like the house was like shaking when all of my aunts were in the house. Nice, so we make an exhibition about laughter. Yeah. Um, Mariana. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm, hello. Um, well, I'm currently in Rio where I'm from, uh, Brazil. And I guess I would say that uh, I am a PhD student. I'm just finishing my PhD at the end of the year, hopefully. On what? And uh, actually, it's, it's, it's about international relations, but I work with Brazilian works of art to criticize how international relations understand conflict and violence as a sort of performance who, do, who don't understand how people actually feel and lived experience of violence. So it's a target, so, but I guess I start to, started to be curious about art when I worked with the Truth Commission of Rio de Janeiro. And one of my works was to develop a plan to create a memory museum for victims of torture and other violations of human rights. And then in this moment, it was a turning point because I got interesting about how people tell stories of violence and how those stories came through art and other, other artistic, artistic expressions for resistance. And then I started to talk with many artists who deals with, with memory and with violence. And since, since this, this time I've been writing some reviews and so on. So I guess my major interest in about what affects me is how people talk about they live the experience of pain and how they make it through art and through space. Because many of these works try, is not to create an institutional idea of memory, but how do you find the traces of the ones who is not there anymore? So I guess it's Have that. you visited Belgrade Museum of Violence? Not yet. But do you know really... about it? 
no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, Lina, who is your protagonist? If we develop an exhibition proposal today, what will hurt you and what will make you push you for writing, thinking? Oh, maybe today nothing because I'm at holidays or at my holiday house, but I was thinking a lot. I visited like the the exhibition at Kunsthalle Wien. I don't know if you see it like the ah, first. Ah, the show. Yeah, and I really... Was, it? It's great, actually, but a they... A good list. I mean, do they have Miladen in the show? Miladen Skilnovich? Yes, I think, yeah. Which piece but they show? I don't remember, actually. Mm -hmm. I have to think about it. My brain is really lazy today. It's fine. Did you did you like Hitos, Hitoshi Hitoshi's work? Which work? The was lecture by Lenciaga. In this exhibition? I think so. I I I know Hitoshi. Maybe work. it was the previous one. This is their first show, was? Right? Yeah. This huge show like about bread, wine and water cars. Yeah, I think it's in that it's in that show. I That's have Three screens with a blue uh, pot, pot. Yeah, I know the work, but I didn't see it in the in the show. Mm -hmm. But I have to. Maybe it was upstairs. Okay. Because I went there shortly. But what I really remember and what I really like was the idea that they put a table up in the second room, and the the initial idea was to invite an artist every week from the show and to on the. And on the table, if you don't see the artist because they couldn't be present, you could write down your thoughts. And um, there was some questions like, how do you feel today? Some questions and you, you start by answering them and then you could write the artist some questions. And I really like the idea, what they proposed was that the artists were present and answer the questions, but now with COVID, the artists couldn't come. So it was kind of a letter exchange. They, the, the audience write down the questions and then someone from the staff, from, from Kunsthalle Vienna, yeah, really like the idea of exchange. And at that point, if you speak with someone, it's like really a direct conversation. But when you write something down, it's, it's you think about things. And if you write I, an answer I down, I really like that idea of, because exhibitions are somehow like really, really fast you look at some, something and then you have an opinion and i like the idea that you have to come back to actually read the answer if you want to see the answer you have to come back see the exhibition another time that was really striking for me i really like the idea lina and thank I, you for this because i i'm working in the field since 15 years and more and more i go into the direction of asking what stays with us after the exhibitions yeah. rather than making the exhibitions because yeah. The physical body of an exhibition is actually uh, an amazing risk taking because if you have a little bit of interest in astrology like me, it's a crazy kind of attempt of life. Like you bring people, schedules and objects and their time together. If you think about this from an astrological point of view or astronomical point of view or zodiac sign, it's a crazy thing to juxtapose a lot of Virgo with Scorpio with Gemini together. You know, it's, you shouldn't do this. But uh, at the end, exhibitions bring people together, schedules together, time schedules together, objects together. But more and more, like in the last 15 years, especially working seven years in institutions, four years at Künstlerhaus Stuttgart and three and a half in art space in Auckland, in two different signs, like hemispheres of our planet, like literally experiencing this shift bodily. Now I ask more and more uh, what stays with us after the exhibitions. But you said the, the artist was not present. I want to show you the curator is present. I, I, was, I was posting this Marina Adnanovic on my story yesterday. So actually the presence of an artist is seriously very important not only physically in the exhibition space or in an opening, sometimes in an aura at a metaphysics level. And actually you are right, the artwork becoming more and more as a, as a prop, as a production, as a kind of stage or a kind of space or virtual reality, it's losing that di dimension. But I agree with this literary reference point. Here I'm in Baden-Baden seeing Dostoevsky Cafe or seeing Gogol House 
or thinking Marx was visiting Baden-Baden with his newly married wife. Actually, it's important, this biographies in tra transition, like the presence, uh, the ontological existence of the artist is very important. Thank you for bringing this. Esther, Esther, Esther. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of fun this year. Yeah. Like, okay, so now I have all this anxiety and tension. My hands are sweating because I have to perform now. Because of me. Because of you. Um, okay, so uh, uh, what do I have to answer as a question? If we would develop a proposal together and everybody yes. has their own music, okay. demons and inspirations, what okay. is your protagonist? I want to feel something. I want to have fun. I want to think about pleasure, about sensation, about sexuality, about intimacy, about breath. <sighs> about smell, about sound, about soil. I want to think about guts, about rush, about fever. <sighs> that's, what, that's what I want to think about. And I would, I would choose the entrance point to be the kiss. Like we all know how I mean it, not the literal kiss, but I do mean the literal kiss. You know, and the Warhol has an amazing film, black and white, the kiss. It's a really nice word. Okay. Mm, that doesn't get me now. That doesn't get. Okay, no. maybe I can help with Paul Preciado. Oh, stop. Okay, that helps. Okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> have you? That's have mean. You, yeah. Have you That's read? The, have you read Learning from the Virus, or have you read the letter? Yes. 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 Okay. Then yes. let me read this okay. because this was this was part of today's <laughs> curriculum. The mutation in progress could ultimately catalyze a shift from an anthropocentric society where a fraction of the global human community authorizes itself to exercise the politics of universal extractivist predation to a society that's capable of redistributing energy and sovereignty. At the center of the debate during and after this crisis will be which lives are the ones we want to save which lives we want mm. to say. Also, this is uh, very important in terms of uh, palasma, and we are going to read some palasma. It is in the context of this mutation, of this transformation of the modes of understanding community, one that encompasses the entire planet since separation is no longer possible, and immunity that the virus is operating and that the political strategy to confront its taking shape. So maybe in the next chapters, we are going to relate curating with immunity, with the community, with the people we live together and how we are separated, actually how we are not separated and bodies of gathering. Because exhibition spaces gather a lot of bodies. Yeah. And in a Freudian sense, also Paul repeats this all the time, there are no politics other than body politics, no? And behind you, is it Jesus or Maria? Oh, no, that's Maria. But that was just like a nostalgic period. It's you a should... nice illustration. I just, I didn't have any time to take her down. Okay, we have Nikki on silence. And who else? Nikki, can we see you or not? Hey, um, well, I can try it, but it might be... Can you don't you seem to have a body. We could also imagine you, but thank you for showing yourself. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, I'm well. Um, I hope that my internet is okay for this. Nice. I it's the only reason I had it off. <laughs> um, thank you. So I, I live in a, my name's Nikki Roach. I live in a very small international city within the city of Detroit, um, but is all land that was stolen from Anishinaabe Native Americans. Um, how did I get here? Uh, well, I'm a Libra. <laughs> and, um, my grandparents came to this area from immigrating from Macedonia and from Germany. And there's a lot of, there's another side that I'm not aware of and that's where I got my Irish name from. 
but um, so that's the how I locate myself um, on the bus or uh, I'd like to watch the bus again because uh, I think I could turn the subtitles off and capture so much more of what was going on because of everything is so clearly communicated with, with the, idea. the expressions. Idea. And uh, I, I really especially love the scenes with the mannequins and when uh, immigrants are observing the, the mannequins and when they're surrounded by this party and it's, it's cacophony, it, that kind of displacement or the unfamiliarity is, is also what I enjoy about exhibitions. Who would be or what would be your protagonist? If I would say, let's have an exhibition. I give 10,000 euro to you, make an exhibition. What would you talk about in this exhibition? What hurts you in life that you want to make an exhibition out of? It? What hurts me? <laughs> um, I don't make exhibitions unless things hurt me. Oh, that, that's a good, that's a good um, measurement. So I think I... I I think there's a lot of like reconciliation that I needs to do where I live in my home. And I, I'm really, my muse is a Coney Island, I think. Do you know what Coney Island is? It's a type of restaurant, but it was also, um, I think it was Meeting a carnival. Pool, no? Also a place yeah. that, like a hub, like a pub. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Also food. So socially engaged art. <laughs> No. Nick, thank you so much. No, now we have, I think we warmed up. Now I feel these icebreakers worked. I'm happy that I studied psychology once in a while. And it's almost like digitally holding hands together. So I think now I feel we are the group. But today, uh, still we have an hour and I have a couple of references. Uh, now, because of these warm feelings, everybody is opening up and being very generous with each other. I was not proposing it until now. Even our dean Rafael and Kasra suggested it. Now, Rafael, you can add everybody on our Google Doc. And I want everyone to have an access to the file. So later they can read my notes and they can come back with suggestions. So actually we can we can be all on it. If you guys want, just send a, send a note to Send a note to Rafael and then you will all get these notes and we will continue. But let's turn it into a discussion. And first of all, Rafael. Dear Adnan, sorry, before you begin. So I'm going to put it in the folder of Adnan's session, this PDF of the document that Adnan was talking about, instead of sharing it. Yeah. How, how technically it is relevant for New Center. So we have these two books from the last years. Uh, one is thinking contemporary curating, another one is culture curate, cu the culture of curating and the curating of culture. It should be somewhere here, Perry Smith, and we should have somewhere Polo Nail. So, Rafael, if you are ready, we can start with Terry Smith. And Moma Kate Pobble is asking a question to Terry Smith after his lecture. And the way Terry Smith defines the position for the curator between an art historian, between uh, a curator and between a writer from different aspects. Let's have this answer from Terry and let's, let's go a little bit briefly to the origin of this discussion. But if in the recent years, there is anything interesting to bring into that class, this tension between Terry Smith and Paul O'Neill is going to give us a lot of discussion. So Rafael, Okay, uh, can you hear it? Okay. So at the beginning of your um, lecture, you were talking about the fact that at one stage, there were, um, if you like, the critics, the art historians, and the curators. And so um, you were explaining how the art historians are kind of understanding the context of the way that work is made. The critics are responding to the work once it's there, but kind of in, in the moment in relation to contemporary society. And the curators are the people who kind of almost have first contact, if you like. They could be in the studios with the artists. 
um, or you suggested that they're the ones that should listen a little bit more and read a little bit more about what has actually gone on historically in terms of understanding and describing a work of art. Um, here in particular and in many places, um, the artist is often the critic, is often the curator, is often the art historian, um, and it's um, less apparent, perhaps, um, the way in which these demarcations have happened. So I wonder if you can talk, one, a bit about that, but also in relation to what you said at the end, which is like, where does criticality come from now? Because there's a big question as to whether the um, critics are still the place where criticality comes from, um, or the art historians. And I know that curators often think that they are now the criticality. So can you talk about what happens when uh, maybe all the functions turn into one person or become one person's job and what criticality is now? Okay, a great, uh, great question. Is this working? Yes. So what you're describing is how things were in Sydney in the late 60s when I started writing. Um, even though on the one hand we had uh, people writing reviews for the local newspapers, of which there were seven in the city, and I think about a similar number across the country, about 20 different uh, essays, a thousand words, 1500 words, about what was in the galleries by critics um, every week, and then monthly magazines, so a very rich critical or Rev more reviewing, <laughs> uh, reviewing environment. It is a problem when, um, at that point, one was also a teacher, because we, only, we had only the second department of art history in Australia at that time. Um, one also curated exhibitions and um, acted as an artist as well. And many of the people writing critical commentary were in fact artists. Many of the people who were directors and curators in uh, museums were artists. Artists were the majority of people on the boards of museums. So you had um, not only lots of conflicts of interest everywhere, and lots of people putting their own works in museums and in public places, which happens when these things get confused. But these people also often were heads of the art school or the teachers at the art school. So criticality, <laughs> in other words, the actual crucial thing that an artist needs and we all need, no matter where we are within this exhibitionary complex, within this system, we all absolutely need the critique and judgment and description that comes from somebody who is committed above all to art and not to you <laughs> as someone whose life they want to make easier or from whom they want to have a favour or and so on and so forth. So it is difficult. Um, but nonetheless, I think a number of people and definitely the people who last and whose work is read later. I mean, there might be people who do well during their own lifetime, but if they haven't actually produced pieces of writing or works of art or created an organisation that doesn't have independent critical judgement and really accurate understanding of history, plus a deeply ethical relationship to how art works in society. If that is not at the core of what they've done, what they've done will not last and never has lasted. Um, it'll become the fiction that it always was. And um, there we go. So it, it, it's, it is difficult, but the practicalities of it are never an excuse for not being subject to the qualities I've just outlined. It is possible to pursue them, and it means that the individual who is, is, is often, you know, a curator, a critic, an art historian, a teacher, I mean, I've actually done all of these roles, but in each one of them, um, I have tried, and many of the people I work with have tried, to follow them as if they 
had their own essential quality, right? Their own kind of purity, if you like. I mean, it sounds naive, but that's what one's tried to do. The curator in particular, going back to that question, is the person in that framework who has this profound responsibility of making a work of art public for the first time, right? The artist, in a certain way, imagines a public or envisages a public, but most artists have to make the work they make. They often make it in, for reasons they don't fully understand, can't articulate, and in fact discover what the work is when they've finished it. And at a certain point, know that that's, as, that's where I have to stop now. Um, it's the curator is the first person to come and see that. Or even if it's an art dealer or another artist who's a friend of that artist, that's, that's the beginning of curating, and but that can stay within the private circle of the artist, if you like. But to actually take the step of making that public, choosing that work to put it out next to that work, another work, because it means X, Y, and Z for a potential public, that's the thing a curator does before an art critic. You know, the art critic is the next one who comes along and looks at the work as exhibited by a curator of some kind. And and tries to imagine what my readers would make of this. How can I give them a bridge to what I've understood about this work? An art historian comes along later, an art theorist even later in a way. So that's how I'd answer. So, so um, criticality okay. is to, um, to kind of summarize what you said. Criticality is to maintain Thank you so much. In a focus on the essential. Uh, Exhibition making is a way of making things public. The process of exhibition making, the everyday, is just as important. Every little aspect is important as a project or as a step, as a stage, from the concept phrase to the distribution, to the documentation. In this sense, absolute seriousness exists in the knowledge hosted by the exhibition. Not as a didactic form of representation, but as a dynamic social framework, political framework, asking questions. These questions take on the form of dynamic, everyday problems. And this is done with playfulness at hand. It's not only visual, but auditory and sensory. And politics is everyday. It's not solely a profession, a concept, a ceremony. It's a concern for a thing, an act of staging attention for public, for us. The politics of the everyday retains as a focus on the overlooked and importantly on the ways in which macro-political concepts such as violence, ideology, COVID, democracy, war, Trump, post-truth, imperialism, human rights seep into the micro level of everyday experience. In this concern for the things, the simultaneity of the spectacular and normal becomes very interesting. When a war is waged elsewhere, people continue to live their daily lives. War shifts from the back to the foreground continuously, where it be a newspaper headline or an explosion, and yet the ordinary functions, response and adapts. To stay relevant in the ongoing set of simultaneous activities that plague the world and affect individuals, their minds and their bodies, is to restrain from a gesture that symbolizes the political by detaching it from its everyday process of negotiation and adaptation. Instead, one creates concern for the common, to mediate states of affairs and to play with modes of making things public or how we make things public through the occasion of the exhibition. What emerged for us in between the disputed states of affairs is the belief that it is political to construct hope today as well as tomorrow. Uh, you heard Terry Smith. Terry Smith is then also an artist from art and language collective that you might remember. And with Dear Terry Smith, we worked on uh, a show together when I was the director at Art Space. It was one of the first exhibition projects I initiated. It was called Imaginary Audience Scale. And Imaginary Audience Scale was thinking about the psychology tests from 60s. And the psychology tests were measuring the imaginary audience and your relationship with your peers, your family, but in terms of how much you are followed, you are observed, or you are, uh, com uh, you are uh, 
uh, in conversation with them. This is interesting because another project that I did years back in Istanbul during Huhanur's Istanbul Biennial has a very ironic title, Big Family Business, which is corresponding to this art bubble, like this quasi family relationships, business relationships in the art world. I mean, Terry's point is very important because Terry also in his book, uh, Thinking Contemporary Curating, Thinking Contemporary Curating, Thinking Contemporary Curating in this beautiful uh, cover, he identifies curating not only in the space of museum or not only in the exhibition space. He continuously refers to Hans Uri, Harald Zinnemann or Walter Hobbes in terms of how they brought uh, new ideas and innovative uh, tools for extending the space, extending the exhibition, extending the museum. So publications, public programs, collections, and education programs, how now they are curated. I mean, it's also ironic that when I was in New Zealand, on the other side of the Auckland Art Gallery, there's a cafe opened and it was called Curated. And when I was walking by Hamburger Bahn of years back in time, there was a renovation and they were putting these banners on the facade of the building and it was written, the new denim collection is curated by Ferry Williams. And sometimes you go to a, a restaurant or you open a blog and they say, I curated your menu. So I think we also have to save the world from its abuse and consumption. But let's, let's think about them together. Like let's, let's watch Paul O'Neill and assertiveness and how a curator is an assertive character operates uh, because he examines the emergence of independent curatorship and his discourse since 80s, also thinking a lot through the group shows. It could be a very good uh, reference for the creative part of curator authors rather than this conventional uh, sense, especially in the 90s, uh, the artist and the curator uh, dispositions and curatorial centered discourse has dominated. But one of the things that gives uh, a lot of space to discourse is Paul O'Neill's book, The Culture of Curating and the Curating of Cultures, Paradigm Shift and Paracuratorial. He clearly defined this terms and also in the uh, file that you would get some quotations from Simon She and Esther Sazakas. There are a lot of references to him, but let's let's watch uh, his, uh, his, his, a part of his lecture. And I really appreciate how he talks about assertiveness here. Let's switch to the, to the Paul's uh, definition of curating five minutes so I'm gonna skip all that and I'm just gonna talk about attentiveness Attentive. <clears throat> so what I'm suggesting is that there are lots of different types of projects which are actually about this take a more durational a different kind of durational approach than the kind of iterative every two years um, and I've tried to um, think about cohabitational time as a means of which people work together, live together, and speak together in order to make the work itself. Um, and I think that this has not only got to do with the notion of cohabitational time, but also got a notion to do with the notion of publicness. And this notion of publicness, I'm going to just, it's like one page, so I'm just going to read it, and it will take uh, three minutes. Um, so I'm just going to describe what I think of attentiveness as a value of duration in, in relation to um, what Alois Reigel writing in 1902, so a long time ago, about this D Dutch group portraiture. And for Reigel, a group portrait, so if we look at this group portrait here um, by Franz Hals, uh, for example, which is one of the artists that Reigel is referring to in his um, analysis of gr group, Dutch group portraiture. He talks about uh, uh, group portraiture neither as an expanded version of individual portrait nor, so to speak, a, a mechanical collection of individual portraits in one picture or representational image. Rather, it was a representation of a free association of autonomous independent individuals. And this is 1902, Alois Reigel was writing this. And for Reigel, he wrote about attentiveness as something which in, inhibited other means of unification, 
between the figures represented in a group portrait. So ruling out the possibility that those being portrayed were restricted to common action or emotion. So for example, for Eichel, this notion of attentiveness uh, was something that he highlighted, which had two forms of coherence. So if we think about publicness, cohabitational time, this idea of being together in order to produce the artwork or to produce the moment which the artwork reveals itself, if we think about Rigel's notion of attentiveness as something which is necessary in order to create progressive notion of publicness, um, it has two forms of coherence. So firstly, within this understanding of attentiveness in relation to Dutch group portraiture, there is an internal coherence between those being portrayed within the portrait or the picture or the artwork, which preserves the quality of like likeness of each depicted subject. So we have a series of people who are being painted and their likeness is depicted some, in some way. But secondly, we have an external coherence, that is there is something else which coheres between them. And this thing which coheres between them depends upon the individuals within the group being attentive to those around them within the frame. But also beyond this, there is an internal, if there is an internal coherence which is diminished, that is the likeness of the individuals is diminished, it can be compensated by an external coherence being augmented. And what I mean by this, in other words, a group portrait such as this could be made to cohere by implicitly including the spectator. So, and that, which was part, and that would be partially achieved by um, the outward gaze of the figures depicted. So, for example, you have all, everybody, in a sense, every figure is attending to something or to someone, whether it be attending to an object or attending to an individual within the portrait. But there are also those who are actually attending to us as we're looking at them, um, which is a bit of a cropped off. But So there's, in a sense, each of the figures are pertaining or attending in some way to something internal to the picture, internal to the work, but also something external beyond the frame of the work. So in this sense, attentiveness is achieved through an equal consideration of the dynamics of the compositional arrangement and the psychological exchanges between the group being portrayed, but it is also achieved through narrative devices established within the picture. So you can see that the objects like the, the bucket of apples which have fallen over, the um, flowers which the figure who is looking out at you is holding in his hand, the activity of particularly the, the young boy and so forth. So there are, some, there are all these other elements that are, that are being attended to within the portrait as the individuals within them are attending to themselves. Um, so within this, this concept of attentiveness, if it were to be applied to durational public art or durational curation, in the latter sense, it can be understood as a type of contemporary group portrait where equal and simultaneous attention is given by participants to each other and to their immediate environment. So there is an internal cohesion achieved through the mutual attentiveness between the protagonists within the group, so the curators, the artists, the administrators, the mediators, the educators, the, the cleaners, the the, the cultural policy makers, the funders, the collectors, all those people being internally attentive to one another, but also an external coherence is encouraged in relation to their surroundings and the world outside the group, so outside the art world, outside the mediational capacity of the art world, outside the construct of the biennial as exhibition. So in this, act, in this way, reciprocity may be created through an interrelationship that is both internal and external to the group of participants, players, actors, performers, actions, and spectators, more importantly. So in progressive durational specific curation, the necessity of a practice of attentiveness proposes a multiplicity, not a multitude, a multiplicity of identities that shift around whilst questioning how to contribute towards curatorial labor as multiple self-image, but also as socialized group portraiture. So practitioners are cu cultural practitioners, curatorial practitioners must simultaneously become both the hosts and the guests to each other, that is everybody else within the constellation of the curatorial space, 
but also where frames of social and humor interaction are put in place to enable the discursive and material production of contemporary art. And I would say that the result can be a cumulative process of semi-public cooperation, where ideas of publicness, hospitality, and citizenship offer both imaginative and tangible potential. Thank you. So you have heard the Freudian lapsus I just made. I, instead of saying attentiveness, I said assertiveness. It's kind of relevant because, uh, yes, you become a curator, but maybe you are made, you are pushed out a curator. Like uh, when you see also the story of a lot of indigenous curators who have chosen, but also supported to uh, work with indigenous practices just it's a it's a kind of instinctive uh, motive it's a drive it's kind of inside that you just want to preserve them i came across with so many stories from different friends of mine who ended up in curating not because they had a super well planned career business plan but it was a necessity i mean they became a curator because of a necessity that their community their environment and their alliances propose them to function and operate in this way. So there are a lot of things I want to discuss and actually time-wise we are doing pretty good. But I want to continue this uh, discussion with the role of the curator changing, especially after 90s, dramatically. We need to come more close to COVID-19 reality and the transition. We have to develop relevant links between these questions. But before doing it, you can read more in detail about how uh, the idea of uh, curatorial, the curatorial, especially after the uh, 90s, has been uh, an important discussion. We cannot discuss this independent from discursivity, collaboration, participation, educational turn, and performativity. So there are a couple of things that we have to map within the seminar. Uh, do you see that? So I'm just going to repeat them again. Discursivity, collaboration, participation, educational turn, and performativity. And of course, uh, we are. Can we can we go through the PDF? The next page. Isn't it beautiful? No, the Brad Pitt one. Yes. Let's stay here a bit. No. So in your uh, in your notes. Uh, there is a very beautiful text written by uh, Esther, and it's on the Transit website. I already put it there for your uh, access, but there, there's a paragraph that I really, really care a lot. So I'm going to share it with you. The curatorial here is defined as a methodology. Maybe after this discussion, we are clearly defining the curatorial as a methodology rather than anything else. So. It cannot be ascribed to a specific set of practices or projects. Its outcome can be a discussion, an exhibition, a space, a book, an action, a combination of all these or other, often intermediary forms. Yet one of the salient features of the curatorial in terms of the people involved may be its collaborative and collective character, as we said. Discursive collaboration, participation, educational term, performativity. So working together curatorially could mean several individuals coming together, sharing responsibility for a project to realize a trust in one another's work within that, as well as potentially realizing a platform that involves others in a longer term, complex and more research-based with many levels. This reminds us uh, of Edith Regov's Derrida's positioning of the curatorial within the gap between a project's proposition and its inability to carry out that very proposition. From my notes, I was more interested in bringing the educational term or education as a kind of important aspect of our practice. So if we, if we need to bring Edith Regov, uh, especially her text, Turning is very important to revisit here. And education is, in this context, is a challenge. Like it is conceived as a challenge. And 
Education is the area in which challenge is written into our daily activity where we learn and perform critically informed challenges that don't aim at undermining or overtaking. When political parties, courts of law, or any other authority challenge a position, it is done within the aim of delegitimizing with a better one, of establishing absolute rights and wrongs. In education, when we challenge an idea, we suggest that there is room for imagining another way of thinking. By doing so, in a way that doesn't overcome the original idea, we don't expand energy forming opposition, but reserve for imagining alternatives. So, Eritrogov brings this Foucault's discussion of parhesia, of course, and uh, in aromatic, the term is invoked in relation to such speech where it's stated openly, blatantly in public. So, Foucault called this fearless speech, and at the end of his lectures, he says, I would say that the problematization of truth has two sides, two major aspects. One side is concerned with ensuring that the process of reasoning is incorrect with uh, one side is con it's very important that I shouldn't skip any line. One side is concerned with ensuring that the process of reasoning is correct in ensuring if a statement is true. On the other side, is concerned with the question, what is the importance for in the individual and for the society of telling the truth, of knowing the truth, of having people who tell the truth, as well as knowing how to recognize that. I mean, thinking this in the age of post-truth is an interesting aspect of our practice because continuously operating between the institution, between the audience, between the board, between the ministry, between the city, between the region, between the media, between the artists, between the assistants, between the curators, between the team. This is why this continuous mediation has to include another layer, public truth. So as a curator working in an institution, working about political issues and within a social environment and within a cultural ecology, how do you help public truth to unfold itself? I think we cannot skip Morarelli's amazing book. Uh, I think it's the next. No, no, it's the next, exactly. Yeah. And when there is also another uh, link for this, Maura wrote about, writes about the, the book. Curatorial activism is a term uh, really uses to designate the practice of organizing art exhibitions with the principle of aiming uh, to ensure that certain constituencies of artists are no longer ghettoized or excluded from the master narratives of art. I mean, definitely uh, it's a practice that commits itself to counter hegemonic initiatives that give voices to those who have been historically silenced or omitted altogether and as such focuses almost exclusively on work produced by women, artists of color, non-European Americans, and of queer. The thesis of curatorial activism towards an ethics of curating takes its operative assumption that the art system, its history, institutions, market, press, and so forth, is an hegemony that privileges white male creativity to the exclusion of all other artists. Other is written back here. It also insists that white male we, this Western white male viewpoint, which has been unconsciously accepted as the prevailing viewpoint, may and does prove to be inadequate, not merely on the moral and ethical grounds or because it's elitist and on purely intellectual ones. This is also an amazing book, not only constituting the term curator as an activist, but also looking at the history of exhibitions in the last decade, how they develop this ground. So I would like to open up this discussion here a bit. So rather than the PDF, I would like to see the whole class. Focus, focus, Rafael, thank you. Uh, let's, let's go back and revisit. Like Terry Smith and Paul O'Neill continues to discuss about the transformation of curating. There is a 
There is a term paracuratorial which we didn't skip, but in my notes, Casa or uh, Raphael, if you can go to the curatorial, there is a title there. After Esther, there is uh, there is Simon's uh, text, uh, and he talks about the paracuratorial. I mean, we can talk about paracuratorial everything else. That's not the exhibition is doing, is becoming a concern for the curator, like really basic reductionist kind of way we can define. And if you if you see that, uh, do you see the paragraph starting the use of the curatorial here? Kasra or Rafael, any of you? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I'm it's the... Tired. I'm too tired. If there is, yes, yes. If there is a shift in contemporary art. Uh, exactly. Okay. I mean, it starts with in the field of curatorial studies, but we mostly covered, but it will be nice to read it from Simon's point of view. When you continue, if curating ah, okay. is a gamut of professional activities, you see that. Okay. Um, in the field of curatorial studies, issues around the future of the discipline in terms of various way of practicing are not surprisingly quite central. And thus also the question of how we can talk about any post curatorial term, but it is so in two ways, or if you will caught up between two modes of production. Two modes that always shift between being complementary and conflictual. The idea of research in an academic sense and the idea of practice in a professional sense. On the one hand, then the curatorial is examined and executed as an academic form and on the other curating is seen as a practice within galleries museums biennials and other forms of exhibition making. And more often than not, these streams are seen as separate, particularly in terms of research methods and aims. On the one hand, there is an apparent meta level of curating, sometimes called the curatorial, with its aspect of theorizing, historicizing, and politicizing the practice. And on the other hand, on real politics, uh, on the other hand, on real politic of exhibition making and its concerns with installation, funding, and publicness. However, um, Okay, however, I would argue that we are currently witnessing a double movement of contraction and extraction. And it is precisely in response to this paradoxical situation that we find the post curatorial term, which so, is to say. Okay. So he calls, Simon She calls this post curatorial term. So actually, this author who writes the history of art through making the exhibition, like bringing the narrative together through a poetic title inviting the artists and then those artists invite other artists this huge celebration of the spectacular we are not there anymore so later he continues this text saying initially the term the curatorial was merely an adjective that related to methods and styles of curating but has in the last decade i mean most probably we are still discussing between the time from 2000s until now in the last decade, curiously taking on the states of a noun, indicating a notion that not only relates to curating, but is also separate from it. When we continue this, his discussion, the curatorial operates at a different level. Uh, it explores that takes place at a state setup, intentional or in, unintentionally by the curator. Uh, it's an event of the novel. So, to drive home a distinction between curating and the curatorial means to emphasize a shift from the staging of the event to the actual event itself. It's in a, it's an enactment, dramatization, and performance. Actually, when you when you continue this discussion, uh, inevitably it comes to how Paul O'Neill discussed the paracuratorial. And actually, I would like that. Kasra, you continue reading the use of the curatorial here. That's an important paragraph that you can continue. The use of yeah, the no. I have to open it. I okay, was I can continue. Rafael, are you there? I can. Yeah, I'm here. I can. Sorry. The use of the curatorial is here then an analytical tool and a philosophical proposition and by indication, a separate form of knowledge production that may actually not involve the creating of exhibitions, but rather the process of producing knowledge and making curatorial constellations that can be drawn from the historical forms and practices of curating. 
the seeds of the post curatorial can thus be found in the short history of the curatorial as a continuation and possibly realization of some of its basic tenets. But post is not the only prefix that has been attached to the curatorial. The curator and creating theorist Paul O'Neill thus expanded on the debates around the curatorial with his definition of the paracuratorial and its relationship to the curatorial as a constellation of ideas and objects. If you remember the video that we have watched a little bit of it, his title for the lecture was also called the curatorial consolation. So this curatorial consolation is an important term. So it's not only curating an exhibition, it is a, cons a set of activities. Please, the term consolation drawn from the Frankfurt School indicates the curatorial as a specific method of gathering and presenting knowledge. Taken literally, a consolation is, of course, not a complete picture, but rather a combination that allows one to draw a picture and make proposals based upon this picture. It's word making through a word view. The paracuratorial is a set of uh, adjacent and auxiliary procedures that practices around and outside the form of the exhibition as such. It indicates ways of setting ideas into other curatorial forms besides exhibition making, be that screenings, talks, performances, discussions, publications, and other discur discursive events. But rather than seeing this as a separate entity, you know, Imagine an exhibition program from an established institution. There is an exhibition and there is an artist talk during the uh, calendar of this exhibition. It's always a little bit of side event, like a lunchbox, you know, like besides, like bonds. No, this is the form. As much as the exhibition, as important as it is in its way of generating knowledge, in its interaction with the community, in its relationship with the form, paracuratorial is as important, public programming is as important as the exhibition itself. Are we clear here? I mean, we are not gonna come to, uh, we are not gonna come to other aspects, other discussions. I think within the part, like this transformation of the educational turn into the paracuratorial is very important in understanding our practice because Zdenska's recent book, Curator as a Comrade, following Rayleigh's uh, point, Curator as an Activist, this is like today it's impossible to define the curatorial without extending its horizons from the institution, from the educational, and from the paracuratorial. Definitely, it's, it's more than. Uh, how 90s curators went into the institutions and with their independent positions like Marta Kuzma was, of course, Marielle, they changed the institutions with creative tools, but the new institutionalizationism, this era, like early 2000s, what's left from this era, that's not even enough. And we haven't discussed the online yet, the new online yet, the new online public yet. We are not taking the algorithmics of contemporary art into account yet. But I'm so sorry, Rafael, I want you to read a bit more because you are a much better reader than me. You see at the end of this page, we are, uh, we say we could paraphrasing Polonail, call this. You, you see that sentences? Um, at, sorry, uh, where? Uh, when we were on the same page. Uh, okay. We could paraphrasing Paul O'Neill call this post curatorial paradox. As we could, paraf uh, I, I found yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. We could paraphrasing Paul O'Neill call this the post curatorial paradox, as well as in other ways describing this along the lines of Tara McDowell's notion of a post occupational condition, where not only curating and the paracuratorial is blurred but also the roles and the vision of labor implied by such categories as artist and curator, thinker and programmer, director and assistant, master and student, and so on, are both willfully and intuitively obscured, if not even abandoned. And as Simon Sheik quotes here, 
if there is a shift in contemporary art away from identifying with specific occupations such as artist, curator, educator, or art historian, then it matters and we should interrogate this shift. Why is it occurring? What new worker has it created? And what reskilling does it ask of this laborer? How does this post-occupational condition reflect or problematize broader social and economic conditions of labor across an unevenly globalized art world? I think now we can go and see the PDF because the PDF has so many visuals that I wanted you guys to have this theory toolbox in front of you. It will take some time to digest this material, but this file, this Google Doc file, all these quotations, all these links, it's in your service. You can get lost in it. Uh, maybe, can you go down uh, the next one? No, no, the next one. Uh, the next one. That's where I work now. Let's skip that. Let's skip this one too. We, okay. Go down. I will. I will. I will say stop. I think this is also a nice one. I just want to talk about what curating means today through a relevant image that we can all connect together. <laughs> Dear Adnan, that picture was Berkan, right? Yes, yes. It's becoming an art space, which is weird. Yes, let's go to Berkheim then. That's a very good, that's a very good thing, Kasran. Okay, go back, go back. Go. I mean, in order to understand curating, I provided you this set of images that it's like uh, tarot cards. Somebody will stop and then the conversation piece uh, comes in. And I think we stop at the Ber Berkheim, no? Invest investigation Bank. Okay. Uh, no, not this one, Rafael, uh, this queue in front of a factory. Up, okay. up, up. No, no, it's much up. Yes. Hey, actually, this one. actually, this is not a factory. This is a club in Berlin. It's called Berkai. And it starts on Fridays and ends up Monday something. Non-stop. There's always a queue. It's a very good music. And... Uh, I think this is one of the things that COVID-19 changed. And now, maybe Katsa, you tell the story. What's Berkheim and what's happening with Berkheim now? And what's Investitions Bank? And what is happening in, to Berlin? What has happened to Berlin-based artists during COVID-19? Let's so, and apply all these theoretical references to a case in Berlin. So what happened to Berkheim was like it was closed due to COVID-19 pandemic, of course. And right now, what is happening is like they have opened up Berkheim as like an exhibition of just the building itself. And people can go like 300 or something people, they can go and visit the space as like an exhibition itself. Because for a lot of people, it was, they were curious to see what is the building for. And it's like a former Nazi uh, building that they turned it into this club. And it has like a stunning interior inside it. And like right now, people are going to just see the space itself. And I was reading the news two days ago, and they are changing it into an art space. Because nobody knows for how long... Uh, clubs will be closed and they have to make money at some point. And in Berlin right now, what is happening is like people, it's, the city is almost going back to normal so far I can say. And I can see like galleries are reopening. Well, they have reopened since I can say like mid June. It was like the first opening that I said. And then one thing that really fascinated me, it was like on 4th of June, I went to this exhibition that I write a review for it, and it's going to be published in Arts of the Working Class soon, that it was like a performative boat ride. Uh, it was like one of the first public exhibitions that happened in the city. And it was almost illegal. It wasn't legal, but the posters were around the city. You could see it. And what happened in that performance was like it was the first time that a lot of people were gathering together and we were going through the canals of Berlin and 
nobody knew what's going to happen actually. So the first bridge pops up and there is like a dancer, like a strip dancer on the bridge and she was dancing. And like, after like five minutes, we realized that this is actually the performance. Nothing's gonna, but like, it wasn't supposed, it was supposed to happen in the boat, but it was happening also in the city itself. And so that started the show. And then there were some people that they were performing inside the boat. And at the same time, you could see other people that they are outside the boat and they were also doing a performance. And it was so smart that afterwards, you could see all the graffitis and everything that was outside the boat as a piece of the art of that performance. Like we couldn't find the like, division between the city itself and the performance that we were watching. And that was like, guess, I guess that's what happened due to COVID-19. Like in my opinion, what we need so far is public art. And I can tell that that's a part of the public art. You sound like Hansel Leopold. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, it let, so let's far. Let's explain what Investitions Bank. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a logo that uh, is taken from, uh, I think this, is, this image is amazing because this logo doesn't exist on this building. If you haven't been there, I might tell you. This is uh, the bank which did all the transactions for Berlin-based artists when Berlin Senate gave 5,000 euro for the time of COVID and lockdown to every Berlin-based artist who clearly documented their amneldum, like the registra registration, clearly. So through this bank, Berlin Senate distributed financial aid. So normally, this club has always this queue and during COVID, this club was closed. And the irony is now people who wait in the queue for Berlin club are waiting in the queue for the application because during the application days, it was always pending. So like online waiting, there was like, like queuing in front of a club. There was literally an online queuing for this, which is interesting image to think about Berlin self-designed artist community and how it functions as a kind of very individual, very specific, very unique form. Because uh, the other day with Chala and with a couple of others for Edinburgh Festival's Culture Summit, we were online and we were discussing about the differences between the UK context and the German context. Because let's not forget where I'm speaking is a state-run institution, Kunsthalle baden Baden. I mean, I was intending to tour you the institution, but hopefully in the, in the last episode. And uh, also when you look at the history of this institution, like uh, the foundation of the institution is amazing. Herren, men established this institution as proudness of their land. So there is a difference between the notion of public funding, how state, how the organization of the structure influences. Of course, in UK, there was no state support for any artist during this lockdown. So this image is interesting in terms of uh, approaching to a community solidarity and how we survive as creative labor because immediately we were not system relevant. Like we, we were immediately the ones who are immediately excluded from the first organization. All the time during COVID, I felt it a bit like wartime. Like for me, I was always interested in the basic needs. I was interested in the, uh, in the context of necessity, like how and what is necessary now to do, what's important to act. And I was very much interested in the notion of solidarity and community. So in this respect, this queue, which is normally a physical, physical queue for a lineup in a, in a, uh, for a, for a good lineup of DJs for a club becomes an online pending application queue for the same creative labor. And I find it's very ironic because if we go to the next image, uh, during the lockdown, basically I earned my money on Zoom. I was teaching for Hivecast Bremen and literally every Friday I was on Zoom. 
and actually it really felt like the Muppet show, you know, all the time. So uh, there, and I think we can really easily shift into asking uh, questions about the future of curating or future of the new public art institution or the notion of exhibitions, how they are gonna change right now. Uh, I would like to immediately introduce you our guests because where we come now through discussing all these things, uh, I leave leave the leave this amazing Rafael. You are you are ideal. I have to say. So next week we are going to have Maria Lind, and I cannot believe that this is happening because for me she's one of the uh, significant voices of contemporary art. And soon we will going to uh, send the reading list from her. Today we were in a conversation with her on the phone and I think most probably her practice is always based on engaging the artist and trying to consider the situation from artist's point of view. Most probably you are going to receive a text uh, written by an artist, but I also insist that we send you uh, one of the most influential texts on my practice, Timing, in her book Selected Writings by Maria Lind. There is a chapter called Timing, and she talks a lot about how timing and the institution and the institutional are very relevant, like how we schedule exhibitions, when do we schedule exhibitions, when artworks are on view. And today, definitely, not only because of COVID, but because of many other things, this ground with ecofeminism, anthropos, and other things, the structure, the infrastructure of the institutions are not able to cope with the transformation. Like uh, I know a lot of artworks which are not shown in the art museums because they, their, their existence, their materiality and their foundation extend these visiting hours, you know? So it's very important to think about performance once again here. Maria Lind uh, curated Gwangju Biennial with Bina Choi and with several other uh, women curators. And it was a very strong one. In 2016, I have also visited. I was working for Art Space in New Zealand. We were one of the fellows. And definitely, I kindly asked Maria to uh, talk about the Gwangju Biennial and to talk about her earlier experience and to talk about timing and her collaborations with the artists. But the most important case she's going to bring is Tensta Constal because she dedicated almost eight years, 10 years to a, a medium scale Kunstverein, Kunstverein kind of structure in Stockholm. Uh, and this Tensta Constal has been uh, engaging with the community, developing a permanent garden, using language and different forms of events, different forms of cultural engagement within the community. She really created a community around Tensta Consta, and I really want us to observe how she, she will talk about this. Immediately, the next one after Maria Lind is, everybody knows Mohamed Salam very well, but Mohamed recently also uh, did an amazing show about Babylon, the myth of Babylon, referring to the myth of Babylon, form of Babylon, but thinking this form, this historical, mythological form at another entity in the zone, in the, in the frame of internet and also algorithmics. And it's interesting to think about opacity, transparency, but also within the form of algorithmics. And Mohammed is an artist before everything else. For me, and also new center, like the space, the learning environment we are in is an extension of his practice. So it's an amazing, actually, opportunity again to come back to this discussion, artist as curator. And then, uh, as I promised, it will be followed by my dear friend, Charla Ik, who is also one of the uh, long-term collaborators for me, but we also share the directory position at the Kunstwelle Bayram Bayram together. And if time will allow us, I will also briefly talk about Kunstwelle Bayram Bayram because all the lectures with me, with Charla, most probably we will be referring to this amazing architecture of the building continuously. And Chala comes from a theater background, even though she studied architecture, she 
work for Gorg together in Berlin, which comes from also a post-migrant context through its repertoire. And we could easily say, not only a curator, but as a dramaturg, she understands performance from a very different point of view. She adds architecture, sound, and dramaturgy in terms of imagining the space for contemporary art. And then September 13 is uh, actually the seventh anniversary of the Istanbul Biennial, the 13th Istanbul Biennial. And it was opened on the 13th of September again, seven years ago. And Fulya Erdemci, uh, independent curator from Istanbul, curated that edition during the time of Gezi Occupy movement, like Tahrir Square, like many other public protests that was happening in the last decade. You, many of you all over the world, I'm sure you, you have heard of Gezi Occupy movement from Istanbul. Things happened around the park again not only Gunsele Baden Baden or my or this bronze bust uh, in my hometown, uh, it's still another park. This notion of publicness and the park still connect us and Gezi Occupy was a very important uh, case for understanding the transition of democracy in Turkey. Also, Fulya from imagining a biennial, mostly happening outdoor installations at public spaces and more like coming from a public domain, she decided to map this exhibition at completely another scale. And this story of this and the story of Gezi Occupy is gonna be very important for understanding, but also Fulia works a lot with public space. And one of the quotations that I could bring immediately about her is, uh, I mean, two things. First, her biennial for 13th Istanbul Biennial was titled, Mom, Am I a Barbarian? It's a fantastic title quoted by a poet from Turkey, Laila Müldür, which really defines and redefines our relationship with Western form of civilization, Western culture and Westernization. Mom, am I a barbarian? So super ironic. And on, on the other side, uh, Fulya, uh, and I share quite a, a bit of friendship and I always refer us talking about public art, not as a permanent install. So for us, for Fulia, the best public art is the temporary art. Like if there is no, there is no promise of permanent uh, installation for public art. When I was sharing this insight with Ingo Arendt from Germany, a really well-established critic who writes for Tats newspaper, he was surprised because in Germany, no one could literally imagine public space without the monuments for the Second World War. So, and then the September 20th, we're gonna have Bina Choi. Bina is such a strong curator. And uh, at the moment, she is the director of Cuts and I also hosted Bina when I was the director of art space and we shared a lot of unlearning activities and you would understand how Bina transformed an art institution together with her team developing different activities like starting the, uh, with cleaning like a clear reference to Ukeles she started to transform the institution and I think after thinking about timing and how the institution is regulated through time or how the new online, the internet and algorithmics is shaping us, thinking about the stage and performance and public space, Dina is going to render us at a kind of location that we really need to imagine the institution as a space for the construction of hope. And we are very lucky because on, in the early uh, days of September, uh, of course with a postponement because of the COVID-19, Berlin Biennial is opening with a new edition and this collective curatorial statement. And Augustine is one of them. And the first thing I'm going to ask him is not the new Berlin Biennial, even though I'm sure he's going to share you the fresh image from the Berlin Biennial. I'm going to ask him, he is now woman identifying and he's now calling himself her, right? Is it true? I think it's true. With, uh, we, let's, we are also going to do a little- I have heard it. We are going to do a lot of gender blender here. And then the last week, I'm hoping that not only me, 
but several artists at the Kunsthalle will be around the round table because as I stated before, I learned curating from the artists and I will definitely invite artists from different, uh, let's say, positions to redefine curating together. So this is the package I uh, actually prepared for you, kind of. So uh, it's going to be a fun sem a seminar and we are going to develop a publication from this process. But what I see as a potential seeing Rafael, can we go to the class? Focus, focus, like perfection. Uh, let's develop proposals, no? Because each of us are devoted, committed, and interested in exhibition making. And each of us can define curating as a space for thinking. So each of us, I am sure, would love to have an opportunity to curate a show when the chance is given. So now we are at the moment a bunch of people here thinking through contemporary art and thinking through curating. Why not tonight you are taking your time and thinking about curating, activism, education, paracuratorial, and all these terms, like I'm sure the way we talked about them was intense because basically I just squeezed and uh, 20 years as a compact zip file and confused you with all over these references. But at the end, the film is still there. At the end, the bronze statue is still there and you could still understand the way how I define curating. So why not starting about thinking, fantasizing or imagining if I would have an opportunity today, if I would be given a chance to curate an exhibition at an institution, what would I talk about? It? Please take notes tonight before you sleep or in the morning, remembering your dream, because sometimes your dreams can bring you very good exhibition ideas as well as jogging or sex. So, uh, so maybe I would like to imagine if we are imagining a publication with my guests, I'm also imagining your contributions for this publication. And it will be amazing to develop exhibition proposals all together. For I promise after we host our guests every week, I will stay half an hour more with you to extend these conversations and individually, I would like to discuss that. I mean, it doesn't matter who is ready or not. We can, uh, we can decide together if every week we can discuss one, two proposals together in eight weeks. I'm hoping to develop at least 15 or 20 proposals. It is good to imagine exhibitions as much as making them. How do you find this week? How do you find, uh, how do you find my speed, my tone, my approach? So I am very open to critics. Come with your kitchen knife and I promise to change my attitude if there's anything that hurts you, if you're offended, just be open because this is a learning environment that we all create together and I want this environment to be a nice one to be with fun and because without enjoying and without having fun, it's tough to learn. I mean, of course there's pain and there's kind of uh, a threshold that if something hurts you, you could be more creative, productive and also poetic, but this environment that we create together is intended to be a safe, safe one. I mean, there is no safe space most probably for any of us, but let's have an intentional safe space together. Silence is important. My I was always uh, going back home, being very excited about my new friend. And my grandmother always says, it's good that you have fun with this child, but good friendships, good relationships, and good companies are the ones who accommodate silence. You have 15 minutes. Maybe some questions, no? Some critics, 
some suggestions for reshaping the next seminars. Shoot. I'm positively surprised um, by, by the way, by your suggestions, by the way that you're framing and talking about it. Because I was like, okay, another one of those curatorial seminars. No. Not me. no. <laughs> um, and because I earn my money as an art educator in a museum, my first proposal would be to eliminate some cu curators that are inhabiting big houses. Because um, what, you're, what you're telling me now doesn't make any sense in the reality in these institutions. But that's another thing. I, I was... Um, I hear Kasch you. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an old shoe, an alter shoe. Um, I, would, I would want to disagree with, with Kasra with your description about the boat and this kind of that the public space became the performance or the backdrop and they became one. Um, and the call for more public art or art in public spaces. Because I do think that Berlin is so, has such a Berghain quality that everything, everything is sucked up. And that of course, it's so easy to, to, to see them as one but actually the whole boat thing only, only was working because of the process of alienation of the, of the artistic performative body that knows how to perform in space and the actual backdrop. And this, this bringing together of exactly this assembly, that's what was working, but the two of them should not belong together, not under these parameters that are not like, that, that's why I, when you were saying that I was like, no, but I loved watching the images of the boat and I, I, I could imagine how, how intense and how, what, I mean, it was just Kasra, a longing, Esther a longing a for art. Point. Yeah. Kasra, Esther has a very good point. Do you think we could put the Lithuanian pavilion in Venice last year next to this performance piece that you are talking about and create a kind of parallelity between Spontaneity, oh, simultaneity, yeah. and also the the uh, timing of the audiences, like how you coordinate. So, do you think the Lithuanian pavilion will be relevant? Because it's amazing that not only individual proposals, but maybe there is also a chance of creating collective proposals here. And I see there is quite an interesting potential to construct something around the new public space and performance now. Mm. So if you're asking me, actually, no, I couldn't see any relevance between the Lithuanian pavilion and this performance that was happening. Actually, I would say it's because of the, if we look at the time and the pandemic that happened, actually, it changed a lot of things. And actually, what was really surprising, regardless of how the performance was going on and what's up with Berlin and the city and the oneness of everything, was just the experience that everybody there were like in a field trip. When we visited the Lithuanian Pavilion, we know what's going to happen. And there when, was, it, when it's going to happen and everything. Yeah. Exactly. And then you had like a whole page of all the lyrics of the opera that they were singing. So you could find it easily. Like, what is this? What are they doing? What's the story? But what happened with this project was we didn't have any clues what's going on. Like it was, everything was a surprise. You're going on there is like a techno music happening, but at the same time, the music stops and there is like an orchestra on a bridge with a choir singing for you out of nowhere. And that was what actually was surprising for us. That the, about the interactiveness of the program that we weren't just like somebody who's watching, we were like, 
we were inside the work. And like, that's actually what is really important for me regarding art, that I really like to make exhibitions or like be in the exhibitions that plays with me, that it stays in my mind. There is a lot of shows happening at the same time. There is so many artworks that you just, you can, you can forget about it in just a second. And what is important is like a work that stays in your mind, maybe for weeks. Until now, it's been like three months now, two months. I, I'm still in that mode of that work. And that, that, that didn't happen with the Lithuanian Pavilion. It just like one week I was really surprised with it. It also made me think about like the boat from the Nice Balloon Balloon, actually. They also had a boat and they did all these boat events. And there's a text, I think from this and Jus Martinez, and it refers a lot about like going, like floating on a boat is like going back and forth in time. You know, like this idea, that's why they put up a boat for an exhibition and also for this events they hosted. There were also events that were like partly on land and partly on the boat, but they describe it as, as like, if you go on a boat, you're on a journey and like time is also a journey. But with a boat trip, you also have to go back. You go like, you go forth and back. That's maybe also interesting. What about Basman Adas? What? What about the artist Basman Adas? I don't know, actually. Uh, in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, uh, also Bas never returned. You know, there is this black and white photo from the performance history, a man who is crying. Uh, immediately I put the relevant information at the, <laughs> uh, at the chat. So when I, when I, uh, when you see the image, all of you will remember uh, Bastiana that, I mean, sorry about this Wikipedia page, but it's basic. So here you go. Uh, because you said something like the boat is a journey and the boat is like the uh, like there, there is a kind of uh, under, understanding of transition like you you register you commit for a change for for a kind of situation but uh, I mean he disappeared uh, on uh, he disappeared in the North Atlantic, he never came back. So when you Google him, especially uh, this image, this, maybe this is clear now. Some of you might immediately remember him. I mean, you need to see, just copy and paste that, please. You would, if you Google him, and the image, you would immediately see, uh, yes, but I mean, an artist disappeared in North Atlantic with the idea of journey and never came back. Maybe it's important to revisit 70s and 80s when there was no biennial or residency or gallery or any kind of business plan or anything, because now with the expectation of recession, with we not becoming relevant, maybe this explosion of the career planning, like this artist curators exploding, maybe I think it's only gonna be the ones who are really truly interested in this and who are really truly interested in getting lost in the Nordic, North Atlantic. And maybe I'm too romantic, I don't know. But I mean, it's very interesting to ask uh, a boat trip is, not only a trip, it's not only a travel, it's not only changing space from one to another, it's not only being mobile, it's also changing psychologically. Ah, sorry about uh, the point that we never uh, discussed about the reading list, but as you could imagine, there were two uh, references that I shared with you. One is my text from Arte is Quarterly about Valid Raad. I adore his practice, but you could see preserving and destroying is so relevant today. So I thought it would be a good introduction for my practice. And then the second thing I choose is Tigun. And if you know Tigun, 
uh, a Parisian collective to stop doing anything but all these previous editions by semiotics. This one that you have, Introduction to Civil War, is also very relevant today. So if you have any questions or comments on the reading list, please let me know. Okay, uh, I just have a few announcements if uh, yes. nobody has any questions. So uh, I am more of the sort of a bad cop in this sense. So I'm just telling about the really like functional stuff that you guys have to do. So uh, here at the new center we have uh, for this class specifically, like the proposal that we have are basically three main things that you have to be sure that you have done in the seminar. The first one is, a pre uh, I mean, you can do them in any order that you want, but like a presentation in which you get one of the texts every week, you guys will get sent a text from the, the, the curator that is going to present some of the texts and so on. And you can choose to present it in which you make a short presentation, 10 to 15 minutes maximum and discuss the text and say it's like set some provocations on that specific text. And then uh, this is counting from the next week already with Maria Lynn. So like if anyone wants to present or to respond to the presentation of someone on any of the texts that she sends, just let me know. I will uh, put it everything on like a spreadsheet organized so we can actually make sure that everybody is uh, at least presenting one of the texts and at least responding one of them. Like that's the uh -huh. minimum. If there are any left, like you can just say, oh yeah, I'd like to present this one too or so on. But like initially you guys have to at least present one and respond one. And uh, last thing I think most important is also the exhibition proposal that Mizao was discussing. So uh, basically- let's, the main make it, let's make it if you like uh, optional because the reading okay. is obligatory, no? Yeah. Let's do the exhibition proposal optional. Okay, so the exhibition is optional, but if you want to do but it- But maybe the lucky exhibition proposal becomes real. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm confident that most of you will really want to do it because it seems like a great opportunity. And also uh, you guys can talk and be sort of like allocated with each one of the other instructors and talk with them and so on and discuss uh, those outcomes. So yeah, make sure to, as soon as we send texts and uh, we are going to send them by you to maximum, I think tomorrow and something, and we want to have all of them packed by tomorrow. So like uh, everybody like presenting and allocated from the texts that Maria sends us, if that's yeah. okay, so. Transition, she's moving to Moscow because of her new role. Okay. She's becoming the cultural attache of Sweden in Moscow. I mean, the text exists in the selected writings book from her. And soon I will ask a friend of mine to make a PDF tonight because literally we have the book. I have the book in Stuttgart in a depot in Berlin in my storage. Now I am in Baden-Baden. Maria is in Stockholm. When I talked with her last time, she was on the bike. Thursday or Tuesday, she's flying. So this, this is my job to provide that because I think... Yeah guys really need to read that text it's amazing like we never think about the institutions from the point of time we always think of them as space and her approach is so smart and intelligent yeah and uh, uh just reiterating them by tomorrow uh you guys will have like uh in the next days you guys will have the text by maria lynn and also by tomorrow, I'd like you guys to signal at least one of the weeks in which you would be interested in presenting and responding. This is for everyone. So we can at least have an idea of, uh, even though we don't have all the text right now, we can have an idea both to fit your schedules and also like uh, creators that you have uh, maybe an idea that you would like to discuss with through your presentation as well. So yeah, I think if do you guys have any questions about presentations and uh, Did you responses? enjoy Tigo? Let's, uh, did anyone read Tikkun? I mean, please, if you haven't I did. done it yet, please uh, visit this because it is so relevant. Like the tension between the in inside this domestic space and the, the new public space, it's so relevant. And uh, also the way they kind of edit their text and co-edit and co-write, it's interesting because it's not one voice. And some 
terminology like form of life, form of being, like it's really relevant for us to add into our glossary. And I have just sent a uh, YouTube link to Rafael to end today's session with a song. As I said, I miss dancing so much. And I thought maybe we could dance together. Uh, this is a Levanten from Turkey, from Istanbul. Before, uh, before the before the before we lose all the Armenians, Greeks, and Levantans, it's an amazing song. And if you want to dance, please join. And every week, I think it's nice to end the end the sessions with a song. And send your songs if you want us to add. Hadi Rafael, play the song. Sorry, we cannot play music because it's of the true. copyright. It's true. Yeah. I it, but you know, it's <laughs> yeah. Nobody Sorry, like my it. apologies. <laughs> now I'm a bad cop. Okay. So, we <laughs> open this link on their videos. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, okay, sorry about it. <laughs> no, I will so find okay. copyleft song for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank knew you, something Adam. was off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. See you with Maria next week. Choose your presentations. Don't forget. Talk to me in the chat if you have questions. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask: um, Are these presentations yes. happening in the class? And what what is the email address to reply to? So please do it to organizers, organizers, organizers. at the okay, new sure. center. Yeah. And dear Rafael, please add me to the. I'm gonna present in the last session by Adnan, and I'm gonna respond in Augustine session, which is the seventh, okay. because I'm like I have a lot of work. I, I don't have time. Okay. Actually. And then I can do it. I can organize this from now. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Have a good day. Okay. Ciao. You too. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.